Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us for today's web seminar. I'm Brian Gamble, Senior Vice President, First Long Island Investors. First and foremost, we hope everyone is in good health and doing well. We have a lot of great information to cover today, so let's get started. I'm joined this morning by some key members of our investment committee, Robert D. Rosenthal, our Chairman, CEO, and Chief Investment Officer, Ralph F. Pileski, our President and Chief Operating Officer, Philip Malikoff, Executive Managing Director and Director of Research, and Edward Pileski, Executive Managing Director. A few quick logistical items. All participants are currently in listen-only mode. After the team delivers the presentation, we'll have time to answer any questions submitted throughout the presentation, as well as some we received in advance. Please feel free to submit questions as we go through the presentation by using the dialog box labeled questions. Uh, at this point, everyone should see a slide <clears throat> with the heading today's speakers. Sorry. Uh, if you're not seeing that, please let us know by typing something into the chat area and we'll try to help troubleshoot. And finally, our general counsel always asks that I remind you that today's session may discuss the performance of some strategies and that past performance is not a guarantee of future results. And with that, I will now hand it over to Bob. Thank you, Brian. Good morning, everyone, and, and thank you for joining us. Um, hopefully, we'll provide some insight into what happened last year, which was a very tough, ugly year, and the prospects for this year, which have started off much better. Our agenda, Brian, would you flip it to the agenda, please? Our agenda is to give some insight into what the market headwinds were in 2022, which caused the lar largest losses in the equity markets since 2008. And actually in the bond market, it um, presented losses that you have to go back 90 some odd years to see. Uh, we'll also look at the current markets, how we see them. We'll talk about inflation, the Fed and actions that the Fed is taking and continues to take. The US economy, what kind of shape is it really in? The 2023 wall of worry, and for those of us that have been with us for, this is our 40th year, believe it or not, we always talk about a wall of worry and there always is a wall of worry. We'll then get into our investment approach and how we've modified it slightly. We'll do a summary and then we'll have time for questions and answers. Next slide, please. Our thought piece that went out in uh, January, uh, we used two quotes this year. Uh, given the difficulty of the market in 2022. And the first quote's from the very well-known investor, Peter Lynch, and I'll read it. There are 60,000 economists in the U.S., many of them employed full-time trying to forecast recessions and interest rates. And if they could do it successfully twice in a row, they'd all be millionaires by now. But as far as I know, most of them are still gainfully employed, which ought to tell you something. Nobody has a crystal ball. The second quote is from the famous investor, Warren Buffett. Um, and it's the true investor welcomes volatility, although it can be painful. And that's true because a wildly fluctuating market means that irrationally low prices will periodically be attached to solid businesses. As an example, and these are companies that we may own, we may not own, and we may own in the future. But Amazon, Qualcomm, Microsoft, Apple, just as example, are solid companies, profitable, well-managed, strong balance sheets, and all of them last year were down between 25 and 50%. So it was an irrational year in some cases. We believe some companies were thrown out with the bathwater, so to speak, and may represent an opportunity. Again, I'm not saying that we own these companies. We may have in the past, we may currently, we may in the future. Next slide, please. The headwinds in 2022 were quite numerous. First, inflation was at a 40-year high. Just several years ago, the markets and the Fed were concerned about deflation. In 2019, inflation was below 2%. Uh, last year, uh, during the course of the year, inflation on the CPI hit over 8%. So inflation was at a 40-year high, and it took the markets by surprise and, to some extent, shock. This caused seven interest rate increases, totaling 425 basis points by the Fed. We believe the Fed was late to the game and perhaps should have started increasing interest rates in 2021, 
Instead, they waited till last year, and it was like a rocket ship with Fed raising rates, including 475 basis point increases, which was unprecedented. Now, we knew we started the year with somewhat higher equity valuations entering 2022, and we were concerned about subsequent multiple compression. We thought that earnings and dividend growth would offset that multiple compression when the Fed started to raise rates. We obviously got that wrong. The multiple compression was much greater. The Russia-Ukraine war was something that was unprovoked, barbarian, probably war crimes. We alluded to a geo geopolitical concern in our 2022 thought piece where we suggested that with Russia, with China, and with Iran, there could be a hotspot that could create volatility. Uh, it proved to be uh, prudent or uh, prescient in that we had the Russian-Ukraine war, which is still ongoing and still ongoing at a pace that is reprehensible. These factors contributed to fear of recession. The rapid increase in interest rates, the inversion of the yield curve for the two-year treasury and the 10-year treasury, the preferred um, um, metrics that the Fed uses, the three-month and 10-year, both are inverted. And historically, that has ultimately led to a recession. Now, whether that recession is six months from the point of inversion or two years from the point of inversion, only time will tell. And certainly the COVID-19 hangover. COVID affected us in 2020, 2021, 2022, into 2023. More than a million Americans died. There was significant economic disruption over that three-year period, and it altered the way we live and the way we work. And this is something that impacted companies, equity markets, bond markets, and it's continuing to a lesser extent, fortunately. And finally, another headwind in 2022 was government spending. Certainly, we all can agree that the government needed to come to the rescue of the economy as the pandemic first hit in 2020 and into 2021. However, the government continued to spend trillions of dollars in addition to that, which we believe has also fed the in inflation bubble that we have right now. And the Fed is now starting to um, try and control that and monetary supply or M2 growth is declining. And Phil will chat about that a bit later. But all of these points, which were a great deal of items to be concerned with and impactful, affected 2022 and contributed to the very significant um, market volatility and the losses that we encountered as investors. Next page, please. Now, all is not lost. Despite the ugly decline in 2022, where different stock indices were down anywhere between 18 and 30 percent, uh, bonds were down close to 15 percent, which was the worst in, in many, many decades. If you look at us as long-term investors or longer-term investors, the three-year annualized return and five-year annualized return, despite the downturn last year, is still a very, very a reasonable, uh, meaningful return of 9.1% and 11% uh, for the S&P. The NASDAQ, which is more growth-oriented, did somewhat better. And as you can see, if you were just in bonds or cash over those three and five years, you didn't fare particularly well, especially given what the rate of inflation is. So what you can see on the chart on the left is the market indices that had climbed the wall of worry between May of 2020 into the beginning of 2022, and then started to go down as the Fed started to raise interest rates. The key takeaway from these charts is that as long-term investors, uh, it pays to stay the course. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're uh, about to celebrate our 40th anniversary at First Long Island, and we've been through many ups and downs in markets. And when you're a longer-term longer investor and you stay the course, it pays off as this chart indicates. Next page, please. Now, you all know that we like to talk about history. And history, uh, we started talking about it again last year 
during the market decline with a view towards being somewhat optimistic and why. If you look at these charts, uh, let's take a look at the chart on the upper right-hand corner. Average S&P performance before and following midterm elections. And as you can see, there's quite an uptrend uh, in the course of a year on average uh, post the midterm election. So that gives us a little bit of optimism. If you look at the chart below that, you can see from 1950 to 2018 or 2019, the average increase in the S&P in a 12 month period following the midterm election was roughly 15%. Now that's history, it's a guide, certainly not a guarantee. If you look at the chart on the left, and we referenced this last year, S&P corrections and one year following the correction performance by presidential cycle, if you look at year two of a presidential term, which was last year, the average is a downturn of about 19% during the course of that year, only to be followed by an increase of over 30%. Now, again, this is history. It's not a guarantee. But when you look at these three charts, you start to feel a little bit optimistic. And as you know, we've started off this year um, with a very solid January uh, into February. However, I must, again, give a note of caution. The one thing that never happened during these charts or the time periods reflected in these charts was a recession. There's never been a recession in the third year of a presidential term. If we were to have a recession, perhaps that would disrupt this very positive history, uh, but only time will tell. Could it spoil the history? We'll have to wait and see. At this point, we don't believe there will be a recession this year. And if we do have one towards the very end of the year or into next year, we believe it'll be a very modest recession. Um, and we believe we'll be able to live through that as we have other recessions. Next page, please. Um, those of you that know us for many years know that we are just big believers in S&P earnings or earnings for the companies that we invest in. Earnings and dividend growth, you'll hear that all the time. Um, and as you can see from this chart, the downturn occurred in S&P earnings in 2020, which of course was the year of the maximum impact of the pandemic and prior to the government coming to the rescue. And then you see earnings increase in 2021. We believe earnings increased last year. I think about 70% of companies have reported thus far their fourth quarter. So we are uh, we do believe there will be an increase when all is said and done for 2022. And then the projection right now, and that's why we have question marks, is for an increase in S&P earnings over the next few years. Uh, keep in mind that the potential for growth in S&P earnings is fueled by continuing positive GDP growth and the fact that right now we're at about 3.5% unemployment, which means the major vast majority of the workforce is employed and wage growth is growing at certainly about 4%. So there is positive momentum in the economy at this point, and it is conceivable that we'll continue to see S&P earnings grow as long as we don't hit recession. Next page, please. Now, just in case we do hit a modest recession, or we do have a downturn in earnings attributed to a recession, in the short term, if earnings decline because of a modest recession, this chart demonstrates that equities can still go higher. The market is a forward-looking vehicle. It looks over the valley. So this chart is to give you some comfort that if we end up where the slight increase in S&P earnings turns out to be a decline, there have been periods in the past, and you see going back to 1975, 1951, whatever, um, S&P earnings can decline, and yet the market, the equity markets look beyond that because it knows that help will be on the way in terms of restoring economic growth, maybe by the Fed dropping interest rates, maybe by the Fed um, doing quantitative easing instead of quantitative tapering, which I'm sure Phil and others will get to later. So if there's a downturn in earnings at some point, then we can live through that as we invest in very durable companies that typically have earnings growth and have dividend growth and can get through a period of where the general market has a decline 
um, in earnings. So again, we think you'll see that the economy is in pretty good shape at this point. Uh, there is a wall of worry. We'll get to that. And with that, I'll turn it over to my partner, Phil Malakwa. Thanks, Bob. Um, so let's go to the next page, which is inflation. Uh, obviously, inflation was a very important factor in what happened last year. And this slide shows two charts which show how inflation is measured by the Consumer Price Index, or CPI, and the Personal Consumption Expenditures Price Index, or PCE, has fluctuated since 1970. Many of us remember the high levels of inflation throughout the 70s, which is on the left side of the slide. But from 1983 until very recently, inflation remained mostly subdued. And, you know, as Bob mentioned, it was as low as one and a half percent for most of the 2018 to 2019 uh, pre-pandemic period. On the right side of the chart, it shows that since the CPI bottomed, and it bottomed at 0.1 percent in May of 2020, inflation has since spiked. It's spurred by higher energy prices, supply chain constraints, and rising wages. CPI reached a four-decade high in June of last year hitting 9.1% year over year. However, since then, it has begun to decline, contracting to 6.4% in January, as the chart shows. What the chart doesn't show is that over the past six months, inflation has only been 2% annualized, and over the last three, just 1.6%. So all this data shows that inflation is currently slowing. The PCE on the bottom, which is one of the critical measurements that the Federal Reserve follows to craft monetary policy, has also contracted to about 5% in December, with January to be reported next week. The Fed has a long-term target of 2% for the PCE and has indicated that it will continue to raise rates until that target is in sight. The good news is that inflation, while still remaining high, is declining and peak inflation appears to be behind us. Lower prices for new and used cars, gasoline, medical care, apparel, food, electricity, natural gas, and fuel have all been drivers of this decline. Let's go to the next page. So uh, this is kind of a busy slide, but what it shows is that it's not unrealistic that inflation numbers could fall sharply in the upcoming months as high readings from early last year fall out of the year-over-year -year calculations. For example, uh, if the month-over-month -month CPI comes in flat or unchanged, as shown in the column, uh, the column with the heavy black outline on the left, year-over-year um, -year inflation will be just over 2% in May and will fall below 1% during the summer. Some might say maybe that's a bit too optimistic. So if we move over a little bit to the right and look at what happens if inflation increases two-tenths of a percent month over month. Um, in this scenario, the CPI would be under 2% in June and remain there for the rest of the year. And as we saw on the previous page, the PCE, it tends to trend lower than the CPI. So it's entirely possible that the PCE will be near the Fed's target in the second quarter or perhaps early in the third. And this could signal that the Fed will complete this tightening cycle shortly. Let's go to the next page. Um, so this, this chart shows uh, how Fed funds have fluctuated since 2005. Obviously, there are a lot of sharp ups and some sharp downs. Um, all the way on the right is what's happened recently. Uh, beginning in March of last year, the Fed has acted quickly and sharply, raising rates eight times, including four 75 basis point raises, which is unprecedented. And Fed funds are now 4.75% um, as of earlier this month. But projections by both the uh, FOMC, Fed fund futures, and overnight index swap rates, which are the, I guess, the green, yellow, red dots uh, off to the right, um, all indicate that Fed funds have nearly peaked and will be lower in coming years. The Fed's last action was a 25 basis point raise and we expect another 25 basis points in March, and then the Fed to either stop or have one final 25 basis point raise in early May. And this correlates to the possible fall in inflation, which we saw on the prior page. Of course, hot inflation numbers or a continued strong employment, which I'll address shortly, could change those expectations. Next slide, please. 
So uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Fed has acted quickly and sharply. And this chart shows just how its recent actions compared to the previous six tightening cycles going back to 1983. The, uh, the thick red line is the current cycle in which the Fed, as I mentioned, has raised eight times for a total of 475 basis points since its first move in March of last year, making this the steepest tightening since 1981 when inflation was significantly higher. It is by far the largest rate increase in less than a year over the past 40 years. So the Fed has certainly acted decisively and we are beginning to see the response in lower inflation data. We are hopeful that these actions will stave off a recession in the near term. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, uh, so besides raising rates, the Fed has other tools to curb inflation. One of those is selling off assets on its balance sheet, including treasury instruments and mortgage-backed securities, or letting these instruments mature and remove them from its cash balances. This process is called quantitative tightening, and it removes liquidity from the financial markets, curtailing inflation. In this slide, you can see that for most of this time frame, the assets on the Fed's balance sheet have been rising, going from about $1 trillion in 2002 to about $9 trillion last year. And for most, much of this time, especially following the global financial crisis in 2008 and 9, the Fed was stimulating the economy via quantitative easing or buying assets. It did so again in early 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and you can see kind of the sharp uh, rise there uh, in that time frame. However, in June of last year, the Fed began quantitative tightening, which started to shrink the Fed's balance sheet. The Fed's stated intention is to have $1 trillion of securities move off its balance sheet within a year. And as of February 1st, the Fed was on target to meet that goal with just over $8 trillion on its balance sheet. Let's move to interest rates. Okay, so uh, two interesting charts here. The one on the left uh, shows what the 10-year yield has done. And really, since the early 80s, interest rates have basically gone in one direction, and, and that's lower. That changed last year when the 10-year Treasury rose from 1.5% to 4.3% in October before finishing the year at three point, just under 3.9%. Uh, this effectively ended the 40-year bull market in bonds and as, bond stated, as Bob stated earlier, bonds, especially longer duration bond, bonds, had a tough year in 2022. Since the high in October, the 10-year yield has been trending lower and is currently near year-end levels. Uh, Strategus, one of the economic research firms that we work with, believes that these yields will continue to fall throughout the year reaching 3.2% at the end of the second quarter, staying there through the third quarter. Um, and as we know, lower rates are helpful to both the economy and equities, particular, particularly higher growth stocks. So the chart on the right shows the real yield on the 10-year. The real yield is an after-inflation yield. With inflation rising last year, the real yield sank deeply into negative territory surpassing the lows made in the mid-70s and early 80s. The real yield is currently negative 2.8%, and a negative yield indicates that the interest earned by owning security is not enough to keep up with inflation. So in quote-unquote real terms, bondholders are losing purchasing power. Let's go to money supply. Okay. Uh, so this chart shows the Fed's estimate of the country's money supply and how much it has changed on a year-over-year -year basis as defined by M2, which economists feel is the most accurate measure of money supply. So what, what is M2? M2 is basically all cash, coins, balances and bank accounts, and CDs, certificates of deposits, which are in circulation. It is often viewed as a, a predictor of future levels of inflation. When it is rising, inflation is sure to follow. And when it declines, inflation is expected to fall. And on this chart, we can see that since 1960, the average year-over-year -year change in M2 is 7.1%. And for most of the time since the late 80s, it has remained under that level. However, when the pandemic hit and people stayed home, they weren't spending. Additionally, some received stimulus checks, both of which led to increased savings. 
This caused the M2 to spike higher, reaching a high of 26.8% year-over-year growth. And as we discussed earlier, 40-year high inflation followed. Since then, the economy has reopened. Consumers who hadn't shopped for goods in a while satisfied their pent-up demand for goods and services and began spending again, and in many cases, spending heavily on luxury goods. Consumer savings declined, leading to a sharp drop in M2 growth to a negative, negative 1.25%. Given the lagging effect of M2 changes, we would expect inflation to continue to decline later this year. Uh, on the next slide, we can see just uh, what's going on with consumer savings. And you can see how it's fallen in the chart on the left. So pre-pandemic, consumers basically had no excess savings. As the effects of the COVID pandemic took hold through 2020 and into 2021, excess savings grew to about 2.1 trillion. Since then, it has fallen almost in half by the end of last year, a trend which has continued into January as evidenced by surprisingly strong retail sales, which were reported yesterday. This chart correlates very well with the rise and fall of M2 growth over the same time period, which we just saw. The chart on the right shows how consumers' net worth has surged since the beginning of the century, rising from about $50 trillion to $143 trillion early last year. Since then, uh, given last year's losses in stocks, bonds, and other assets, uh, that figure has declined slightly. Let's move on to employment. So probably the strongest part of the economy has been employment, which last month experienced its best results since 1969. The unemployment rate, the red line on the chart on the left, hit a low of 3.4% for the first time in over 50 years. After experience, experiencing a huge drop in the number of workers employed early in the COVID pandemic, these figures bounced back in late 2020 and have risen ever since. They are now about, there are now about 155 million people employed in the country, up from about 130 million at the depths of the COVID-induced recession. And that number has been increasing every month, as you can see. The chart on the right shows an interesting data point which is an outgrowth of the strong employment data. The chart shows the ratio of advertised job openings, known as JOLTS, to the number of unemployed workers. There are currently about 11 million job openings and more than 1.9 job openings for each unemployed worker. If everyone looking for a job was hired, there would still be over 5 million job openings with no one left to fill them. The 1.9 ratio is near its all-time high and up from its pre-pandemic high of about 1.2. Let's move on to housing. Um, so now over the years, housing prices have had both booms and busts. We saw the, the busts in 2008, 2009. But recently, there's been a boom due to low mortgage rates, tight supply, and demand fueled by people moving to warmer climates and moving from multifamily buildings to single family houses. Home prices started soaring in 2020 and continued until early last year. During the first quarter of last year, home prices as measured by the Case-Shiller Index were appreciating by more than 20% a year. With the Fed raising rates last year, mortgage rates rose as well, in some cases jumping by about 400 basis points, making homes much less affordable. Home prices are still appreciating, but at a much slower rate. And I would expect at some point that national, nationwide home price appreciation will turn negative as it already has in, in some areas. On the right, you can see that not only are home values uh, showing decelerating growth, but the number of homes being sold is falling as well. Uh, it shows the inverse correlation between the number of homes sold, which is the solid blue line, and the 30-year mortgage rates, which is the dotted red line. It is apparent that when rates fell from 2018 to early last year, the number of homes sold skyrocketed. Then as rates rose, the number of homes sold fell by almost 50%. Let's move along. Okay, so uh, this page highlights some factors which were at one point issues for the economy, but are returning to or are at more normal readings. Uh, we all know one of the major contributors to inflation during the pandemic was the breakdown of the global supply chain. Uh, 
The chart in the upper left is an index that measures how much pressure was in the supply chain. And it shows for most of the time from 1998 to 2020, there was minimal or negative pressure. However, during the pandemic, it, it spiked. And it didn't spike once, it spiked twice. And while today it remains above its historical average, it has significantly declined from a high of nearly five to under one. Another contributor was the price of shipping containers. The Freightos Global Freight Index shows that pricing rose from about $1,500 pre-pandemic to a high of $12,000 in late 2020. It stayed elevated for a while, but has now declined to about $2,000 near its original levels. The chart in the upper right shows that manufacturers' new orders fell significantly during the pandemic. They have now improved to the highest levels on this chart, which goes back to 2011. And finally, uh, the banking system, which was near collapse during the global economic crisis in 2008, continues to track near recent highs, signaling strength in the banking system. Let's uh, go to the next slide, please. Okay, the wall of worry. So uh, the wall of worry is a list of concerns that are facing the economy and global investments. It is considered a contraindicator. It is believed that the higher the wall, meaning the more concerns there are, that the better it is for investment returns in the future. Currently, the wall is both high and deep. Here are some, but not all of our concerns. Inflation, Fed policy, the ongoing effects of COVID, government fiscal policies and soak the rich tax proposals, government spending, the deficit and debt levels, geopolitical risks with Russia, China, Iran, and other problematic countries, and the potential for a recession, which you know, we know will happen eventually, although we don't foresee it until sometime next year at the earliest. I will now turn it over to my partner, Ed, who will discuss our investment approach. Thank you, Phil. So I'll spend some time on our investment approach. Um, the key here is to maintain a diversified portfolio with a prudent asset allocation. It's really, really the foundation of how we allocate your assets and invest. Um, as you know, we, we customize an asset allocation for each individual client based on their different needs, goals, and risk tolerance, along with how we view the market. Our roadmap, which you can see here, is how we define the investment landscape. And these four baskets are how we allocate your capital. Through a prudent asset allocation, our goal is to protect and grow your assets over the long term. So as we move from left to right, we expect each of these baskets to provide better returns over the long term with more risk. Starting with the first basket, security investments, we would recommend maintaining a somewhat underweight allocation with a focus on quality and short duration. Um, with rates still relatively low and below the rate of inflation, we would prefer to see more attractive return opportunities exist, especially on an after-tax, after-inflation basis. Um, moving on one basket to the right, we have our defensive strategies. These are designed to mitigate volatility with lower beta than the broader market. Participate in the upside when the equity markets do well, but also protect on the downside when the equity markets have declined. An example includes our defensive, uh, within this defensive strategy, our dividend growth strategy, which invests in high quality dividend paying stocks that have demonstrated sustainable growth in dividends over time to achieve superior returns for our clients. We're recommending clients overweight exposure to our defensive strategies, which we feel provides our clients with reasonable appreciation potential while taking on less risks with its defensive characteristics. And then if we move one more to the right, we have traditional equities, which we are modestly underweight. While our first priority is to preserve capital, valuations are attractive, and we still believe long-term opportunities exist and a meaningful allocation remains appropriate. The final basket is private, private investments, uh, which we'll utilize as appropriate. And when we remain opportunistic, where it's suitable for certain clients, as it's typically less liquid while providing more diversification. Next slide. 
continuing on uh, with regard to our investment approach, um, as we as I stated previously, we're allocating away from in fixed income and towards defensive strategies. This chart demonstrates comparative yields. One of the main reasons we remain somewhat underweight fixed income is that despite the recent rise in yields, you must consider the reality that yields remain below the rate of inflation. For example, as you can see from the chart, the five-year U.S. Treasury and municipal bonds are below the current inflation rate on a pre- and after-tax basis. So we continue to recommend fixed income as an important yet somewhat underweighted component of our client's diversified asset allocation to offset market volatility, generate consistent stream of income, and preserve capital. Next slide. Dividend growth is one defense against inflation. So even if volatility continues to pick up and stock prices fluctuate, these companies in our dividend growth portfolio are increasing their dividends on an annual basis and well above the rate of inflation. As you can see from the chart on the left, this shows that since December of 2011, the compounded dividend growth of our FLI dividend growth strategy has outpaced the rate of inflation. The portfolio's average dividend growth is 9.3 as compared over that same time frame to an inflation rate of 2.5%. The annual inflation rate in the U.S. As the end of, at the end of January 2023 was around 6.4%. So our dividend growth is continuing to outpace uh, even the current rate of inflation. Our dividend growth strategy is predicated on the Gordon growth model which supports our belief that the expected return of a stock is approximately equal to its dividend yield plus the sustainable growth of its dividend. As shown in the bar chart on the right, over the past 10 years, the dividend growth portfolio has yielded 2.9% uh, and its dividend growth rate has been around 9.2%, giving it an expected return of 12.1%. The strategy's actual net performance has been 10.9%, which, as you can see, is relatively close to the expected return of the Gordon growth model. As we stated before and have preached, dividends provide a defensive nature to this investment and have contributed to the ultimate total return. We're continually looking for companies with attractive cash flow dynamics and managements that are committed to returning cash to its shareholders. Next slide, please. This chart clearly and effectively demonstrates that long-term equity investing has been rewarding. It, it illustrates the power of compounding returns. The blue line represents the S&P 500, the red, the 10-year treasury, and the green, the 90-day US T-bill. You can see that the chart demonstrates the importance and the effects of compounding over a long period of time as equities have meaningfully outperformed both bonds and cash. If you invested a million dollars starting in 1997, this chart illustrates the power of compounding over this 26 year period with the S&P index materially outperforming both the 10 year treasury and the 90 day T-bill, even with that dip in 2022, uh, still a wide uh, margin of outperformance here. Next slide, please. And I think a key theme in our um, investment approach is how difficult it is to time the market. And uh, you know, timing the market versus spending time in the market uh, are two different things. So this chart shows the importance of being invested and not attempting to time the market. If an investor missed just the five best days in the market within this 28-year period, it can have a substantial impact on your compounded annual return. Uh, just missing uh, the, the best five days, you could see the difference uh, as compared to being fully invested. That's uh, eight one versus six three is a big deal uh, when you're talking uh, over a twenty eight year period. Um, so not being invested just for just a few days uh, or the best days within the market can materially impact your performance. 
Emotional reactions to market fluctuations can range from greed to fear to hope, which can often lead to bad decision making. Committing to a well defined and customized prudent asset allocation enables you to stay the course through market volatility, which often results in solid performance returns. And this enables you to achieve your long term financial goals. An effective way to avoid emotional investing is by working with your team at First Long Island Investors to discuss your asset allocation to ensure it provides you with financial peace of mind and enables you to sleep at night. I think it would also give clients comfort knowing that we're investing side by side, investing side by side and our interests are aligned. I think that uh, gives clients comfort, especially during a difficult period like last year. Uh, we want to take acting emotionally out of the equation, particularly in the face of market turbulence by being properly allocated amongst our respective strategies. I'll now hand it off to Ralph to talk about the earnings yield. Thank you, Ed. Good morning, everybody. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we have followed religiously over the 40 year history of First Long Island has been an earnings yield bond yield. And uh, you can see from this chart, uh, it compares the S&P earnings yield to the 10 year treasury. And you currently, the um, the S and P earnings yield is about 5.24 percent, and the 10-year Treasury. Well, this was at December 31st. Is 393. It's actually moved down a little bit to 382 uh, as we speak today. The the S and P earnings yield, for those of you who don't know, is the inverse of the price earnings ratio. So um, you've got the earnings divided by the price, and then uh, what can happen going forward? There are a couple of things that can happen. And you can see by the, the chart of the, the big divergence between the two, and that's why the equity market has performed exceedingly well the last couple of years, with the exception of last year. The, um, on the earnings yield, uh, earnings can go down, you know, and, and that can affect the yield, or prices could go up. That also can affect the yield. So that those are the two characteristics that can change there. On the on the ten year Treasury, interest rates could move up. But if you notice what happened with the ten year Treasury, uh, what really happened as the Fed had this humongous increase in interest rates is the short term rates have moved much more quickly than the long term rates. So my my guess is, and it's only my guess, is that the ten year Treasury will trade in a range somewhere between three and a quarter and four uh, percent. Right now, like I said, it's about 382. So when we're when we look at this as one of the things that we look at, uh, this has worked fairly well in, in our history. And right now we still see an earnings yield uh, way ahead of the 10 year treasury. Brian, next chart. Okay, so let me try and summarize what we've talked about today. We've thrown a lot at you. Um, despite what happened in 2022, the U.S. equity markets have provided strong results over the long term, including the three, five, and 10 years that, on a chart that Bob had showed you earlier. And with about 70% of the S&P companies reporting already for the fourth quarter of 22, earnings are growing, we believe are growing in 2022, and they're forecasted to modestly grow in 2023. Could that change a little bit with if, if a recession happens, which we don't think it will? Yes, but um, that's probably a 2024 event. The economy itself <clears throat> is doing reasonably well. Unemployment remains low, although we expect it to increase. Inflation remains elevated, but, but you can see the trend is it's starting to come down. And, and impacting certain businesses, some more than others, as well as consumers. The Fed uh, actions combined with elevated but declining inflation are in part driving the current uncertainty. And uh, there, it's probably dying down a lot more today than it was a couple of months ago. I, I think the market has already discounted the Fed, uh, saying that, that they think the Fed is actually going to stop somewhere in, at the this year or toward the end of this year. The ongoing geopolitical hotspots, whether they be those mentioned in this chart, 
as well as our own political divisiveness in Congress needs to be watched. Uh, now that we have a split Congress, uh, you know, all bets are off in terms of what can happen. Next page, Brian. Uh, as Ed said, we believe in a prudent asset allocation that is overweighted to defensive strategies uh, and somewhat underweighted to fixed income and modestly underweight to traditional equities. And we think that's the best course for investors at this point to prudently grow their wealth over the long term. Maintaining enough cash and high quality short term fixed income, earning a higher rate of interest to sleep at night is part of a prudent, diversified asset allocation. I have always felt that um, people should have at least two years of cash, uh, whatever their uh, living expenses are, figure that out, have two years of it put aside, and then you can survive anything, especially something that happened in 2022. Concentrated portfolios of companies with strong fundamentals and managed with a focus on quality and secular growth trends and or growing dividends should prove successful over the long term. I mean, if you look at what our dividend growth strategy did last year, we we had um, pretty much about an 11.5% growth in that dividend. We outperformed the S&P by about 600 basis points, and it, was a, it proved to be a pretty good defensive strategy. Uh, reviewing your overall wealth management plan with an eye toward understanding the tax, charitable, estate planning, and insurance options is a critical step, and we can help with that obviously in conjunction with whoever, whoever your accountants are, whoever your legal professionals are. So on that note, uh, I'll turn it back to Brian for some questions and answers. Okay, thank you, Ralph. And thank you very much, everybody, for sharing all of this with our participants. We'll now begin answering questions from our audience, and we've gotten some great questions already. Please continue to send your questions over, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Okay, first question. Um, what factors will contribute to the decline of inflation over the coming year? Um, Brian, let me let me uh, try and answer that. I think we've presented a very interesting chart in the M2 growth or lack of M2 growth. So when you look at what the Fed is doing, and to, you know, to Ralph's point, we think we're in the seventh or eighth inning of Fed increases. So maybe there are two 25 basis point increases left which will slow the economy and slow inflation. As Phil pointed out, there is quantitative uh, tapering at this point, uh, not easing, but tapering, where the Fed is shrinking its balance sheet. That also will slow inflation. And then when you look at that M2 lack of growth, whereas historically M2 growth has been 7.5%, and right now it's negative, uh, all of those factors should contribute to a decline in inflation, as well as some of the other points made. The supply chain disruptions that roiled us uh, during 2020, 21 into 22 have really turned around. And uh, I'm on the board of a company where we import a lot from the Far East and our typical container cost pre-pandemic was about $3,500 or $4,000 a container. It went as high as 25,000, and now it's as low as 55,000 or 5,500. So it's come way down, although many companies have to eat through the inventories with the higher costs. All of those factors should contribute to a decline in inflation um, and a meaningful decline in inflation. As Phil pointed out with the charts that he showed, it could be fairly dramatic as time goes on. At the same time, wage increases are still reasonable, uh, and that will contribute to the buying ability of the consumer, which is 70% of the economy. So, you know, all is not doom and gloom. Uh, inflation will come down. The Fed will eventually stop, and there's a good chance that equity markets will recover even more when that happens. Bob, can I uh, add one more thing? And it has nothing to do with the Fed or any government actions, but there are companies out there who are fighting back from their suppliers. Uh, a company like Walmart earlier in the year asked its suppliers to lower pricing because you know they jacked everything up when inflation was at its highest. And now that it's abating, they'd like to see some lower pricing. Uh, 
uh, you know, they feel it can't just go one way. It has to come down when it, when it makes sense to come down. So, you know, th there are other things out there that can help the inflation rate uh, get to more um, normal levels. One, one last point. It's not a straight line down, though. Um, e even the number that came out this morning, there'll be zigs and zags. Um, for instance, shelter uh, is a key component of the CPI and the PCE. And shelter has yet to be reflected. It's still actually being recorded as going up in terms of cost, but we all know that rents are going down and house prices are going down. So uh, later on in the year, that will reverse. And instead of being a contributor to inflation, it'll be something deflationary in our opinion. Great, thank you. Uh, so sticking on the inflation theme, um, you know, with, with elevated inflation, although, you know, coming down recently, uh, and the Fed still raising interest rates, is the strong start to the year for the stock market concerning? Uh, I don't think it's concerning. I think that there's a bounce back. The markets tend to overreact on the upside and on the downside. So we may have started last year a little bit too high. Uh, interest rates went off like a went up like a rocket ship. Uh, the market corrected. And as I pointed out earlier, some very well-known, financially strong, well-managed, dominant companies were down between 25 and 50%. I'm not talking about the ones that don't make any money. I'm talking about very solid companies. Uh, and there was an overreaction. The, you know, the baby was thrown out with a bathwater. So what we've seen in the beginning of the year is a bit of a bounce back. There also was probably repositioning of portfolios at the end of the year, tax loss selling. Um, all of those things contributed to uh, what perhaps was an exaggerated downturn. Uh, as I, and I said earlier, uh, the worst downturn since 2008. Unfortunately, there were 14 years in between. Um, but nevertheless, uh, I don't think, I think there's just a bit of a bounce back. And as you can see, earnings are still coming out fairly strong and inflation is decreasing, although at a modest pace. All of that contributed to the bounce back for the first five weeks of the year. So it's not a concern to us. It's a, it's an adjustment uh, that maybe things were overdone last year. Yeah, and I'll, Bob, let me add to that because I, I, I think I've been saying this for a long time, and I know we all feel the same way. But the two things that I worry about are interest rates and earnings, and uh, everything else is kind of noise that affects the traders more than the investors. And if you look at what's happening, interest rates skyrocketed in 2022, and the market took it not well. And that's why you saw the prices come down so much. In addition to prices were probably pretty stretched at the beginning of 2022. So what the market is saying today, and if you, you got to look at what the bond market is telling you, the bond market is telling you the Fed is almost at an end to raising rates. Maybe they're going to raise another 25 in, in the next meeting and maybe, maybe 25 after that. There was some noise this morning that one of the uh, Fed governors was talking about a 50 basis point increase at the next meeting. I don't think that's going to happen. And the other factor is earnings. And the market is always going to follow the earnings. It may not do it in the short term. There may be no correlation between market prices and earnings in the short term on a year-to-year -year basis. But over longer periods of time, the market price will always follow the earnings. The, the question becomes, going forward, what are those earnings? And Bob had presented a slide earlier in the presentation where you looked at the earnings for the next couple of years with question marks. That's going to be the key question. And historically, when you look at the history of First Long Island, we've always been able to accumulate portfolios where companies' earnings are pretty predictable. Um, and, you know, do they go down sometimes when, when we go into recession? Yes. But... Uh, what happened this year, and, and Bob alluded to it, is the companies got pounded on last year all are rising quickly this year. And why? Because the, the companies last year earned what they were supposed to earn. They're earning what they were supposed to earn this year. And the market is readjusting to that. So the worry points are interest rates and earnings and, and really nothing else. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, last question here, which I'm going to aggregate because we've gotten several versions of the same question is, can you comment on the current stalemate regarding the debt limit 
and the possibility of government default and any impact that might have on the markets. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that because some, I'll be one to take it. As many of you know, you know I'm somewhat um, politically involved where I know Congress people on both sides of the aisle uh, and some people in leadership uh, in Congress. And I, I can assure you that there are active negotiations going on right now. This is a, a, a movie we've seen many times before. The debt ceiling crisis, uh, and it always, because they're politicians, it always goes down to the last day or two. Um, I have utmost confidence that the United States will not default on its debt and that there will be a resolution to the debt ceiling. It will be increased. Uh, there may be some you know, cost savings associated with it, but uh, Kevin McCarthy, who's the Speaker of the House, uh, the minority leader in the Senate, um, and the majority leader in the Senate, they've all said the same thing. There will be a resolution to this. So there may be some volatility. There may be some stuff on cable news and in the newspapers that, you know, that scare us. But at the end of the day, this country will not default, in my humble opinion. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, and that is the last question we have at this point. It's approaching the top of the hour. So I would just like to thank everybody for uh, joining us today. Um, <clears throat> hope everybody found the session interesting and insightful. Um, if you feel you have any friends or colleagues who you think would benefit from joining future events like this, uh, please let us know and we'd be happy to include them. Uh, and for our clients on the line, I'd like to remind you that our investment committee is always available to discuss your individual asset allocation or wealth management needs. Please just give us a call. Everybody have a great day. Thank you very much.